uh, it'll probably do better than most uh, than most things that you want to speculate on. But you know, it, it depends. I mean, what you're going to do. You might want to have uh, some other metals. You might want to have you know maybe put ten or twenty thousand of it into some of the silver stocks that have really been beaten up because the silver goes up. I mean, it's possible these things could could go up uh, a multiple of that. So um, okay. Um, you know, anyway, and, and, and think about the Perth Mint, too. It's a great place. If you're going to have that much silver, if you have $60,000 of the silver, it takes up a lot of space. It's expensive to store. Having it over at the Perth Mint uh, solves a lot of those problems. Yeah, well, we're going to do it through you, you guys, actually. Yeah. All right. And one last thing. Thank I, you. Oh. Next call is uh, Tony from Florida. Is Tony online? Or Tori, rather. Tori. Is it just raw land right now? It's raw land. Tori, hey, turn down your radio. You're playing back what I already said. To me, I mean, what I would try to do. Can you turn down your radio, whoever's on the line? Is that Tori? I don't know who that is. Let's skip to Ed in uh, Minnesota. Uh, just call on with a couple of questions and a comment. I'm one of your smaller clients, I'm sure. I got uh, one rolled over at IRA and also a cash account. And uh, my question was, and uh, what do you make, if anything, of the fact that the government uh, is putting the car makers through quite a ringer to find out what the viability of their business plan when they loan that money out for the bailout with no requirement for the banks to tell them, hey, we've got this business. This is yeah, I mean, look, you think, you know, I mean, that would be one thing that they could talk about. It's like, hey, you know, there were no strings on uh, the money you gave to, uh, you know, all these banks. You gave billions of dollars to all these lending institutions, and you didn't, you know, you didn't do anything. And, you know, why is it a different story for the automakers? And, yeah, they've got a point, uh, but, you know, I don't, I don't think the government should be bailing them out, period. I mean, so I don't even think, uh, you know, that it should matter. Uh, certainly, if they're going to bail them out, I mean, I guess they have a right uh, to uh, to ask for concessions and to try to, uh, you know, to put some restrictions on the money, the way it's going to be used. But, again, I don't like that. I mean, I don't like the government bailing out a company and then trying to micromanage it, trying to give them advice on how to run their business or, you know, how to make cars. I mean, if these politicians knew anything about making cars, they'd be in the car business. I mean, if they knew anything about doing anything, they wouldn't be in politics. They're in politics because that's all they know how to do, which is basically nothing. You know, they can't run their own businesses, so they run other people's businesses into the ground by taxing and regulating them. So we do not want a society where these cronies in Washington, bureaucrats, are trying to uh, run businesses when they're obviously incompetent at doing it. And, of course, they're running businesses without any risk because it's not their money. You know, it's our money. It's taxpayer money. And they're making decisions for political reasons, not for economic reasons. And as I said, you know, none of this worked in the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, centralized government planning has failed everywhere it's been tried. Why do these idiots think it's going to work if we do it in Washington? You know, they're no smarter than the Russians who tried it or the, when the Chinese tried it. The Chinese, you know, after, after, after decades of central government planning, the reason that the Chinese economy is prospering now is because the government stopped doing that, by and large, and, and freed up the market to do it. And now, you know, we're, we're doing the opposite. Yeah, concur with all, with all you said, but I think they got the upper hand on us. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the question I had was, and I'm, this is my first year investing with you, and I'm taking a beating like everybody, but I'm in it to, to get the upside someday. And uh, my question is a kind of a nuts and bolts thing. Uh, on my uh, forms that I get back, it tells about foreign tax withheld at source and that sort of thing. When it comes to B tax, I'm number one, will I get a uh, uh, complete uh, tax? Uh, yeah, what happens is at the end of the year when you get your statement, you will get an accounting of how much foreign taxes you've paid. And it'll be part of your, you know, the 1099 a year in statement. And you simply either, you know, give that to your accountant or if you're doing your taxes yourself, you know, you can use that as your foreign tax credit, uh, it, you know, for your taxable accounts. And, you know, for most people, you know, you'll be able to recoup 100% of what you paid in taxable accounts in foreign taxes against your U.S. income taxes. Now, if you don't pay any U.S. income taxes, then you can't get it back because it's a credit against taxes that you pay. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to owe taxes. If you've had taxes withheld from your wages over the years, and now you pay foreign taxes, you can you can actually get a refund. You can qualify for tax refund based on the fact that you paid foreign taxes. Okay. I'll be looking forward to it. I pay a lot of taxes, so I'm looking, yeah. looking forward to that. All right. But, and the comment I had was uh, I've been dealing with John Downs all the way through this thing, and John Downs is just an outstanding person. He's Yeah, well, I'm sitting in John Downs' chair right now in, in his office, and I'll relay uh, uh, your, your sentiments to, to John. 
Yeah, tell him, tell him I'll see him for another uh, beer and a Mexican dinner one of these nights. All right. Okay. I will. Yeah, bye. Take care. Uh-huh, bye. Next up, I believe, is Mike from uh, Indiana. Hey, what's going on, Peter? Hey, not much. How are you, Mike? Not too bad. Hey, I'm a farmer from the Midwest, and uh, I own a decent amount of farm ground. Mm -hmm. What's this devaluation of the dollar going to do to that? Well, I think, look, I'm very bullish on agriculture. I'm bullish on farming. I think uh, you're in a good business. I think more people ought to go into farming and, and horticulture and agriculture and, 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 and those types of uh, businesses. Uh, I think there's a whole world out there that's going to want to eat, and you're going to help feed them. And I think it's, you know, I think what you want to do is just, you know, try to have an efficient farm as you can and, and try to, uh, you know, run the business and realize that you've got a lot of Americans who are going to be hungry, a lot of people all around the world that are going to be hungry, and you try to efficiently as possible, you know, produce the food and, and, and distribute it, you know. So you think that farmland is going to keep appreciating I think so. I think right now probably it's not because, you know, no land is appreciating because nobody has money to buy. Uh, but, you know, I think that you don't need to sell it. You just need to operate it. And if you can, if you're a good farmer, I mean, I don't know anything about farming. I mean, if I had a piece of farmland, I wouldn't know what to do with it. I'd have to, you know, have to release it to somebody who did or sell it. But if you're in the business, if you, if you know, if you understand, you know, how to, how to, how to, how to farm, it's, I think it's a great business. Yeah. I got a question too on after this deleveraging is done and, you know, throughout the commodity sector. Um, what do you think the ultimate bottom will be in gold and crude? Oh, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's just no way to know where the bottom is. I mean, we might be at the bottom right now, and, you know, chances are we're not, uh, but we might be. But, you know, I don't know. I, I think that ultimately prices are going a lot higher. I think, uh, you know, because think is held up. I mean, gold rather is held up very well. And I think, you know, gold, I don't think it's going to collapse like some of the other commodities. I think gold is, is held up well for a reason, and I think a lot of people are figuring out that need to store their wealth. I think gold is the best place to do it. But oil, I mean, I think this big drop in the price of oil is ultimately going to help uh, sow the seeds for a much bigger oil rise in the future. I think oil is going to go a lot higher now because of this decline than what would have happened had it never fallen. And I think the reason for that is, you know, when you get this precipitous decline, $140 a barrel down to $50 a barrel or lower in a short period of time, that scares the hell out of the exploration industry. That scares the hell out of alternative energy. That keeps capital scared. So you know what's going to happen when oil prices get back up above $100 a barrel, which might even happen as soon as next year? People are going to be afraid. People are going to say, you know what? I'm not going to commit new capital to this oil industry. I'm not going to commit capital to alternative energy because, you know what, the minute I do, the price can collapse right back down again. And I think this is putting the fear in a lot of people, and I think OPEC is just loving it because OPEC, what OPEC wants is for people to not believe in high oil prices because they don't want the additional capital being committed to exploration. They don't want the gear, the world gearing up to foot with alternative energy. And so when you get these major declines, it scares everybody. I mean, I think OPEC loves it. And I think what's going to happen is now oil prices are going to have to go even higher and stay there even longer uh, before people, uh, you know, have the, have the courage uh, to commit capital uh, to, uh, you know, to solving that, that, that problem. Okay. All right. Thanks for the call. Okay, bye. I think next up is uh, Marty in California. Yeah. Hi, Peter. How are you? Um, thanks for taking the call. Um, I had a question in regards to uh, a couple of things. I actually invested $150,000 today at Euro Pacific, um, and I bought some Perth Mint. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm, I'm listening to you right now and everything, and you're talking about the stocks and everything. I'm a filmmaker, so I'm, I mean, as far as this kind of stuff, I feel like just recently I've taken the red pill and just kind of like opened my eyes and everything. So. I'm just trying to kind of get into it to make sure that I do the right thing so I can preserve the money and, and be able to, you know, have a... Well, yeah, I mean, I think you're doing the right thing. And for those of you who don't understand what the red pill is, it's...